Greetings in the name of the Most High. I'm starting over again because I realize I've been embarrassed about my whole life. And um, I just want to tell you that 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 the time to not to, to for that embarrassment to end is now. You know, I can't help <clears throat> that the circumstances of my birth. I can't help the strange things I've found out going on around me and the the horrible gauntlet of the of the of the of the, of the spiritual warfare and the the whole sort of Rosemary's baby esque life that I had in you know in in, in um back in Los Angeles. I, I can't help the, uh, you know, I, I had to find out the truth, you know, and part of that involved, you know, I was writing fiction about the same thing, you know, and almost like it's a litmus test to see if anyone out there could confirm it, and someone actually did, who actually, you know, knew my situation and said, yeah, you're, what you're writing about is all real, and it's like, it was just hidden from me, you know, and we've talked about all these things for years here, you know, for quite a long time. And I still find that, I still wonder, I suppose, if there's people out there that know and aren't saying or they, they don't know. And I found that most of them seem to know and have agreed on this pretend world of this, what I call Disneyland, you know, and they, and they, they don't want to look at you know, the thing that's monitoring us all and has been for thousands of years. The thing that, you know, there there really is a big conspiracy. And I mean, I was on an earnest quest to find out what happened and why I was traumatized as a child and why why there were satanic rituals and what was all that about anyway? You know, and I, I just, it was just not like, you know, foreign to my to me as a person, you know what I mean? So I wanted to find out, was it real or I was convinced by others that I was just deluded. I was, it was just fantasy. I, well, it couldn't have been real because nothing like that really exists. Oh, there may be pockets of people called Satanists here and there and you know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of people here and there, you know? But no, no, no big overarching deep dark system that runs the world. I mean, that's ridiculous. And it's funny, I came across an article, a couple of articles that uh, the director of this film that, that I was involved in writing because I was, well, I was writing the screenplay in secret and then I finally added a writing partner to it because I was getting traumatized by the thing because I thought I was writing fiction and then eventually someone from the actual film when they were casting it, they called me and said, you know, I used to teach tennis at your parents' house and whatever and everything you're writing about there is real. I'm like... Wow, that sort of, you know, that kind of did it for me. Because I was convinced that, of course, and nothing like that could be real. Anyway, you're never going to get to the bottom of it, you know, just like, uh, just like a real-life Rosemary's Baby. You, you, they, you don't get to the bottom of it. You know, it's, it's just there's a deception there involved. And, um, and I'm, I'm not, you know, people say, well, he's writing an autobiography of his own family or something. And it's like, no. The family was but a metaphor for the system. But see, they don't get it, you know, the people that analyze this film. And, and apparently it's still around and even more popular now than ever because something in it just keeps people watching it, even though, you know, the director and the producers rubberized it up and made it kind of 80s campy horror, you know what I mean? But underneath there's there's a strong theme of a conspiracy and... and I think the director was trying to even move away from the conspiracy, but then he actually put in like a they live kind of thing into it um, as part of it, you know. So people just like the they live thing lives on, you know. Um, this one lived on for some reason, and now I find there's like if you want, you can get a, a two CD, a two DVD, um, you know, Blu-ray edition. I'm like, but this thing won't even die. But in looking at the articles that were written, and there were fresh articles written in like Fangoria and another film magazine, even the, over the last few months. So it's still, they're, they're doing deep analysis. I mean, and they've talked about in the articles how some people are doing PhD dissertations on it and, 
you know, so that's all good. The director's having a good time, you know, it's like he's, he's older now and this is, you know, it's funny when you look him up, he's done dozens and dozens of films and, but this is what comes up, right? And this was his uh, going from a producer to a director, which he, he had wanted to do. And so, you know, this is, this is his thing. So he goes around talking to audiences about it. And there's, you know, they have, like, they'll have screenings of it. And he, you know, takes the microphone and talks to them. So, but the project began with me trying to figure out what happened. And I'm there in a screenwriting class. And then... Next thing you know, I'm writing this thing under, and I'm 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 I'm, I'm getting panicky about the whole thing, and and you know, cold sweats, and it's like, it's just fiction, right? So that was the dilemma that I faced, and then you know, during the actual filming, and and he, the director, knows this full well that when that casting assistant called me and said it's all real, you know, and and I'm I'm like, you know, because she had known me from before and she just happened to have this gig you know and just and read the script immediately called me and I was like and I said it can't be I don't want to believe that and it flipped me out so much I went running off to Italy chasing my ex-wife and you know then then you know with the help of her and and some doctors on the phone and whatnot they they convinced me that you know it was all just a mistake, you know what I mean? It just it couldn't have been what I said. And, and certainly it's so bizarre that it, 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 there's an interface here with Hollywood and movie making. It, it, not my, I mean, I didn't even know why I was writing the screenplay. I, I had no, no idea it was going to wind up, you know, going into production. And, you know, even if it was on a low budget thing with, with horror producers, I had no idea. But it happened, you know? <laughs> And at the same time, during the actual process of the pre-production and, and casting, and the, you know, I was told that it's all real, which totally traumatized me. I mean, obviously, because I thought it was fiction, but then I was locking in the door. So, I mean, I was really messed up, okay? Really messed up. Because I was told, you know, unless you want to be institutionalized, you're going to have to, you know, admit that none of this, you know, all that is you know, whatever I came in, you know, whatever I was telling them, you know, the the handlers and the doctors, you know, whatever I was telling them, uh, I had to renounce it or they were going to, you know, throw the key away. So they were very interested in my going on to the Truman Show, agreeing to Disneyland, and then, you know, I I got my freedom. Isn't that awful? <laughs> so later, you know how the truth comes out in a screenwriting class, and then after the class was over, because I, I remember I was writing something else in the class, and then this thing crept in, and, you know, and like I say, I had to get this guy, Rick, involved, which is interesting because it's my brother's name, Rick, because I needed some companionship because I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, cope. I was having trouble, you know. And then later on, I was, you know, obviously devastated and horrified that someone would call me who knew my situation and said, it's all real. I just read the, you know, and they're working on casting it. I mean, truth more bizarre than fiction. I mean, my story was more bizarre than the actual film itself. It's all real, which then I, you know, I couldn't accept because I was programmed to think nothing like that could exist. And then I was just writing a piece of fiction, right? It's just fiction. Meanwhile, the, the, the filmmakers have got this story going that I'm this crazy guy from, you know, Beverly Hills or whatever that's writing an autobiography, but that I'm crazy, so none of, the, none of it's real. It's just my own fantasies, which is a lie. And, and I, you know, I've got to think they're not stupid. They must know, but it was like a good for marketing. I guess that was the cover story because... That helped in the marketing of it to make me the fool, to make me the buffoon, you know? And uh, so the, I, you know, distanced myself from them and the whole project because obviously I had become part of it in some way. And, uh, 
you know, I was disrespecting myself by playing the fool for them, by giving them what they wanted to see. I mean, how is that not a satanic ritual in and of itself? Of course it is. So the whole thing was traumatizing and awful, and I'm just, just telling you that I had read the articles yesterday, and I've been sort of in shock the whole time, and I had a podcast yesterday that was three and a half hours long, and I thought, I can't bother you people with that. It's, that's very self-indulgent, and I was defending myself. I was being defensive, and I was talking about my bona fides and how I have skin in the game, and, you know, and, and, and I'm not going to let people you know, shame me. Well... I played the fool on this one. I'm the crazy guy, the crazy theory that, you know, I'm just the, the, the lost, you know, rich kid uh, wandering around, um, you know, with, with craziness, you know, and, and, and the director, you know, made something artistic out of this, this almost untenable thing, which was me. And uh, that's just a, all a lie, you know? You know, people fall into whatever's going to work for marketing and everything. But I mean, there was even a little flavor of that in the two articles. But it wasn't bad. It wasn't like I was put down. It was just, you know, it was okay. I, I, I you know, I mean, obviously, if 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 he he was, you know, being really nice and saying, "Oh yes, this is from the mind of," you know, he's a genius, and we got this story and then you know, we realized all this stuff was going on with it and then we tried to make it into a movie and then, you know, it really, you know, there was none of that. It was more like, you know, they wanted to have, since it was an ongoing thing, they wanted to have all the credit and, you know, the writers were, the writers be damned, I think. <laughs> so funny because in 2013, there was another interview. I don't even know why I started looking at these interviews. I... I was looking at somebody else, and then it, and it, it just kind of, you know how it is on the internet, it just stumbled into Brian and company. And anyway, the, 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 the director there was, you know, had owned, bought the rights to it, and it's out on Blu-ray, and you know, here it is so many years later, you know, it's still going around conferences or pictures of, you know, and I'm like, people actually go to this thing, and they're reading into it things that were never intended you know, they're reading into it like it's this, this special meaning. And, of course, the filmmakers have, you know, have, have, you know, I haven't fostered that kind of mythology, but they have because it's good for business. You know, it's show business. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's bizarre. But I, I can tell you right now, the only, the, if there's legs on that thing, and apparently there are, and the reason that thing endures and why, you know, and people reading into stuff that was never intended to be there, they just, now they take credit for it. You know what I mean? Uh, the reason it endures is because it started with me having to lock it away. It's those vibes, those bones that are there resonate with every single human. And that's why it won't go away. Because I'll tell you why. Because the screenplay is about unresolved, you know, an unresolved trauma to an innocent person, me, who's trying to figure out what the truth is. And of course, it took a bizarre form of writing a screenplay that uh, I don't think I ever intended it to be into, produ into production. I, I had no, no thought. I mean, when it went in, I was just, you know, I, I kind of switched personalities and I became like, oh, I'm a filmmaker and I'm a successful writer or whatever. And, and that's not how it was. You know, I wasn't treated like that. It was, you know, the incident was, I was told it's all real, and I sort of flipped out. I was convinced Disneyland is what's real, you know? I worked, you know, very hard to, you know, to think that I must have been just been deluded with any kind of other thought. Well, I was very painful is what it was. And, but just like the truth bubbles out, you know, it, it came out anyway in the form of that. And then, you know, God probably just, just you know, it was God lifting up the foolish thing to confound the wise. Anyway, there's no danger here of, I know back in 2013, the filmmaker guy, who's, that was his directing debut, he's a producer actually, but now he's, he actually had a screenplay of Society 2 that he had took to Cannes with him. There's a Cannes, during the Cannes Film Festival, there's a 
a film market in Cannes where, you know, people sell and buy projects. Just like they have in, you know, um, and so because it was very popular in Europe and it still is. It's really more of a European film. It's not really uh, accepted in America except for cult, you know, certain kinds of horror audiences. But anyway, so he, he as late as 2013, I mean, that's just like yesterday. He's got a screenplay called Society 2, and this is how many years later? And he's shopping it around, and I'm like, you know, the joke about that, I can tell him right now, that, um, that, that, that dog won't hunt. Unless it's got the real thing in it, like it had a real thing from me in it, this kernel, this spark, this spirit, this soul. And that's what, why it endures, you know? Even they can, they can twist the story any way they want, it's still the same story. But there was something in it. And that, of course, couldn't be in this Society 2 thing. And you know how they try to do sequels, but it's never as good. Anyway, he's, he, the, the, apparently there was enough success on it in recent years that he felt he could take a, you know, hire people to write a screenplay, or he wrote it or somebody wrote it, and, um, and go around shopping that screenplay around, uh, you know, taking an expensive flight to Cannes in the film market. I mean, taking a risk like that because feeling like he had something that he could, you know, that could go into production. And I can tell you right now, it, 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 it's just a disappointment waiting to happen because the, the source of the whole story was me. <laughs> and I guess he's got some antipathy with me or, you know, he, I don't know what it is. He's got, a, you know, he, he just wants to have all the glory and, you know, the people that wrote it or whatever. He just, he just, he wants to have the, he doesn't want, you know, to be bothered with it. And, of course, he wasn't going to find me again. And he could easily because, of course, everyone knows who I am online, you know. And most everyone has listened out in L.A. and, you know, at least once before being disgusted and turning it off and saying, well, nothing's changed. He's still as crazy as he was before. Um, and or you get this, you know, he's too crazy for me to deal with which is what I got from people, the online ministers. And then I, I had resentment about that. Now I'm just telling you people, I'm, I'm letting that go. I mean, you know, yes, I did play the fool for them, but I mean, you know, I, I was functional. I mean, I, I, you know, wrote something and then I survived through several rewrites. And then finally, you know, in the end there, right before shooting, I, I, you know, when I was told that it's all real, of course, that, that pretty much floored me and I had to leave LA, you know, I had to leave. And then, then I came back all put back together with Disneyland the first day of shooting, I remember, and it was down at Paradise Cove in Malibu. And uh, I showed up there, as I was, I was gonna be in it as an extra. And I was all happy that something I had written was in production. And, and I remember I walked up to the director and he goes, hey, we're filming our movie. You know, he was all happy sitting in a director's chair. And, uh, you know, life was good. I just had to be convinced that, of course, it's fiction. And I had to kind of put that other thing out of my mind, that casting director call, which was really a tennis teacher from, you know, Beverly Hills. I, it's a long story, but it, you can't make this stuff up. The coinky dinks and all the stuff that, it's just bizarre, bizarre, you know. And um, then I was reading the articles intensely, you know, trying to figure out, wow, they're so interested in this subject, in this society film. I mean, they're so, you know, going over and over it, you know, and getting deep into what did it mean, this thing, and what are these symbols? And, and, and I think the director, Brian, he was trying to make it about social issues and, you know, things like that, which he'd never intended at the time, but it's, you know, so they're getting into all this sort of um, intellectual mumbo jumbo about the film it had nothing to do with that that's not the reason the film worked that's not why people want to keep seeing it again and again you know even though it, i'm telling you it's, a, it's 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 horribly done and you know bad acting and everything but now it's like all that was intentional you know what i mean time has been a, a nice healer of that of that process it survives because there was something in it that was real that the filmmakers and all their rubberization and campiness couldn't couldn't beat out of it that having a writing partner, he couldn't twist it out of it. it. The thing that I had put in there, the original thing, stayed. That the spirit, there's a spirit of unfinished business, of something that resonates with every single human being on earth. 
And that's why I contend that films like They Live, out of all the John Carpenter films, you know, that survives as being the classic because it's something that people know they need to deal with. And, you know, uh, and other films have endured, you know, that, but I mean, that the They Live is a special, people are still quoting that film today. I mean, it's so popular. It's as popular today as it was then because it's dealing with a certain subject that we all seem to know in our DNA. So I was just like a kind of a traumatized, innocent person. And I underscore the word innocent. I was very innocent. I mean, obviously, I was made innocent, like, like Betty in um, Mulholland Drive when she first arrives in Los Angeles. I was, you know, there was like a, 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 a confabulated in, innocence from that, that I was a, a crafted innocence, if you will. You know, the world is like the, you know, the world is like this and it's like Disneyland and, you know, I, I'm going to really put my best effort into being a good screenwriter and, you know, and boy, I can't wait to have, see my credits up there on the screen and, you know, it's all going to be good. You know what I mean? It was just like, it was like that, the woman in, in Mulholland Drive. It, I watched Mulholland Drive about a, a hundred times because there's something in it that kept resonating with me. No, it wasn't for the lesbian sex. Although it's nice that when they had lesbian sex, they were nice-looking women. I mean, I'd say that rather than old hags, you know. But that's that's not the allure. The allure was the mind control, and the um, and Satan being there. See, everything I was writing about was Satanism. That's what I saw when I was good. That's what the, you know, everyone was telling me did things that that they all labeled me as so crazy. But see, it's like they 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 must have known it was real. They must have known it was real. Or they wouldn't have spent so much money creating this alternate life for me that didn't exist. You know, would they? You know, and I mean, I know they're trying to bring me back and make me a productive member of society, but after this trauma, this thing I'd been through it, how is there ever, how is there a going back? I mean, all they could do is put me together in a fantasy world. And, you know, appoint friends and people make it look like I had friends and whatnot when everybody is harboring a secret. Is that it? I mean, doesn't this filmmaker, you know, uh, and I'm going to shout out at him. I'm, you know, I enjoyed working with him when we worked. I've I've enjoyed his company. Um, Any, you know, criticism is just like, you know, the professional uh, opinion, you know, based on being an artist, uh, that I know that it's what I am. I mean, they tried to tell me I'm just a crazy nothing. I can never claim anything for myself, but I, I do claim to be an artist of some sort. You know what I mean? And so, therefore, I do have some artistic integrity, and I have an opinion about things. You know that that comes from a professional opinion. You know, but other than that, in terms of personally, I. You know, I enjoyed the company of this director. We worked on a lot of stuff together, other films, you know. Um, you know, we worked on two other films together that got made. And so I got to know him pretty well. You know, when you're a writer and you're in, in the trenches with a director and you're, you're, you know, basically they start dictating the script to you you're like a secretary. But, but it's okay. You know, you're there and, and, you're, and you're, you know, you're in the trenches and you, you really get to know a person. So I really, but at the same time, I realized at some point he'd have to throw me under the bus, you know what I mean? It's, it's, you could see that coming on the horizon, that, the, you know, we were not going... We, my life was so different than his, you know what I mean? And it was just... You, you, there just couldn't be a... like a real friendship, unfortunately. And I need to take a note of that, you know, if, if that ever have contact with this person again, I, I have to know that, you know, be you know, cautionary, you know, you, you, we're not going to just be all bros, you know, it, even though I wish things were different and I, you know, it's like I wasn't treated the way other screenwriters were treated, you know what I mean? I was the fool, that's all. But I'm coming to peace with it now, finally, at long last. It took this many years to... Well, some people never come to peace, but I mean, I, I obviously, you know, like I say, I remember time heals the wounds, and, I, and I'd like to just keep my fond memories of, of working with these guys. Plus, there was a, my friend, the producer, he was there working with us. I remember late into the night, we were working on drafts, 
you know, on the screenplay at three and four in the morning. You know, I, I just remember those days. And so I had my friend, the producer there, who also told me that it was all true. And then we went through a whole battle with him later on, and he ended up making films about the Boston Strangler and other people and, you know, just sort of more horror films. And he was doing that while we were friends. But I was not, you know, he'd hire me to rewrite stuff. He'd pay me under the table. You know, it wasn't like... You know, it was it was weird. It was weird. There were, there, obviously, I became some kind of a, of a social pariah in the mythology of myself that was created by these filmmakers of, you know, doing some kind of um, I'm insane, doing a crazy autobiography that's not true, but it's but I'm crazy. So I have these fantasies of incest or fantasies of sexual abuse or whatever that are all just fantasies and I'm just writing you know what I mean there's like this psychological explanation that I'm nuts and and uh you know not telling the truth and that's not true but if what I'm saying is true you see the it it it, it tears apart the entire society that's the problem it's a threat it tears apart everything it means there's this deep, dark secret in our world and, you know, maybe three quarters of the people know about it and are nodding and winking, keeping their mouths shut, and the other third of the people are traumatized by it and being victimized by it. And if they come up with any kind of notion about it, they're called conspiracy theorists or wackos or they need the doctor or they're crazy, even though the people labeling them crazy know all about what they're talking about. So that's the real truth of it, and that's why you're never going to have people contacting me from that realm, because they're scared to death of what I have to say, especially after having almost 14 years, be 14 years in March, testimony online, you know. And and no, I sometimes a podcast does. I consider these to be total confirmation that that you know what they would say about me in the past would be incorrect. And I have been eloquent and I've been not crazy at all, just trying to lay it out so that we can see something that ordinarily couldn't be spoken of without, you know, like when you hear people do a, a testimony of gang stalking, <clears throat> it sounds like someone that's psychotic. I mean, I'm sorry, but when they label the incidents and go, this happened, then these people did this, then those people did that, and then I went to the Walmart parking lot, and then they were following me, and so I video, started videotaping them, and you go, okay, let me see the videotape. You look at that, it's just people in the Walmart parking lot, and you go, well, what do you mean? You know what I mean? They look crazy. But I've been able to do something, and this is my service to humanity, okay? It's like I've been able to then put it all into something that we could look at that wasn't crazy, and of course, through the lens of Jesus Christ, through the lens of you know the Bible and the God of the Bible, Yahweh, and all that, through that, that that's what really brought me to the truth. You know, the Lord opened my eyes and He clarified it all. And yes, it was all true. All my suspicions were true. God help us. And so, for me, you know, that project, society, was just simply a metaphor if you will, for the world system, that's all. It was still a piece of fiction. It wasn't some autobiography of anything. At the time, I, 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 like I said, I didn't believe anything like that at that time. But I was frightened by it because obviously there's memories that I was suppressing and a whole other life that I was suppressing and another life, another personality that had been sort of molded on top of my personality that was sort of like this is the way you have to be, or it's not going to work out. <laughs> Me and I might not even be around. You know, that's the kind of threat I got. So I really, you know, and now, of course, it's all out in the open, right? It's all out in the open, and people can say whatever they want, but, I mean, I have Christians who I know know the truth, calling me crazy. So the same thing that happened with in the filmmaking community happened in the Christian community, the same result. Oh, he's too crazy for me. He's super unstable. I had to, you know, I mean, this is like Rust Dizdar. I had to 
to, 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 to break fellowship because he's so unstable and crazy. What all I was really doing was trying to find out the truth. And Ross had known, you know, the, the book I wrote, uh, Lamb, and he, he made an endorsement on it. He didn't, he didn't poo-poo that as crazy. You know, admittedly, then I went on to Glass Backwards, which was, well, this is like even better than society. Ever. This is really, this is really, the, it was really a piece of fiction and it's really uh, twisted in a way that nothing else is. But I mean, it's sort of like hidden and invisible, but probably instead of doing something like Society 2, this guy, he should take a look at Glass Backwards because there you've got the same thing going on, but a whole different kind of scenario about an assassin that's a, 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 a multiple personality, uh, you, you know, Manchurian candidate type of guy who starts off committing matricide and, and ultra-violence like Clockwork Orange and then uh, ends up working for a Hollywood producer to bump off people that the producer doesn't like. And at the same time, he's got his, he's, his programming is coming unraveled and um, and all kinds of weird perversions and weird stuff goes on in there. It's, and it's, you know, it's fictional, but it's just a really bloody nightmare. And um, and it's a potty mouth book. You know, it's got, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's not written for the spiritual community at all. But, uh, and it's got the Hollywood story and all that. So it's got all these elements that are hook, hooks for people. That would definitely, you know, uh, be a commercial, uh, whatever, you know, the same. But see, I can't reason with these people. You know what I mean? I, under normal circumstances, I would send the book over there and just say, hey, take a look at this. This is better than what you're trying to do. And, um, but they can't, see what I mean? They can't give me that respect. It's, it's just weird. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's like I have this reflected image of, of being like a non-person or like I don't count. You know, and, and, and you know, I'm, it's, I don't have, I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of having had the experience, but I, it wasn't like, a, you know, the other screenwriter guy or even like my partner who was, had a different experience. You know, it was this, I, I can't even explain it. It's, it's happened... You know, there it's happened uh, in the Christian community as well. It's not like it's it's got to do with me, you know, obviously, or the way people react to me. But um, my self-image was so beaten down, and I felt so bad about myself and so ashamed of being alive and being such an embarrassment, you know, to everything and everyone, apparently, that I could barely keep my head up. You know, I was always depressed and you know having to. You know, and then and then I realized later on that you know that shame doesn't really belong to me. Being singled out as the odd man out or the, the one to be mocked or the laughing stock that they can do that if they like, but I I don't need to own that. You know, that's that's not me. I've done nothing wrong here. Why should I act like I have done something wrong if I haven't done anything wrong? You know, and and I, this is all kind of like healing in the last maybe a year, year and a half that's been, you know, coming my way, thank God. And, you know, I certainly not at an enmity with the world. I certainly don't hate anyone. And I, and I really enjoyed, like I say, working with these people and with this director. And, you know, we've had some good times. I, you know, don't know why I wound up being a fool, being, being the, you know, the, you know but, but it's best that I'd stayed away, you know, because... I don't know, gosh, it's so, it's so, it's so insane. It's so far beyond any logical thing that it's, I, I try to explain it here in the Zeff Report, and I do very well. I'm very articulate with what I'm saying, and I know what I'm saying is the truth, but... It's so bizarre, isn't it, folks? I mean, it's so insane that it's beyond insane. It's beyond insane. Like my daughter would tell me, she goes, it's like you went into the complete insanity, the complete insane world, and you came out the other side. 
you, you survived it, the gauntlet. So she knows. She's like 25, she knows everything. I didn't know any of this stuff when I was 25. I was, you know, that's about the time when I was writing the screenplay. Trying to, you know, it was actually a little later than I was more like 30, 31, 32, something like that. But I was, I was trying to figure it out then. What happened in L.A.? What happened with, you know, the society around me? It wasn't just like my parents. It was the whole thing. It was, you know, the guy down the street. It was the law enforcement people. It was the, 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 the friends, the childhood friends, their parents, this, that. The, it was everything. I was like, I, I, am I, is it, is it, maybe it's just me. Well, folks, it turns out, you know, society does everything they can do to keep this secret. But it is a secret, you know, it's, and, and it's a secret that's revealed in the Bible. <clears throat> and what we learn in, in God's word is basically that, yeah, this is the system. There's no conspiracy here. It's laid out in the Bible perfectly, exactly what it is. So finding that Bible and laying my life down before the Lord and just, I gave up, you know, I, I don't have any aspirations of any... <clears throat> Well, the reason I never marketed, you know, lamb or glass backwards to the extent I could have is because I feel embarrassed of my work, and so I don't promote it. I felt embarrassed of the podcast yesterday, so it didn't go up, and, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been embarrassed. You have probably hundreds of hours of things that never made it up there onto the potosphere, into the, into the you know, cyberspace, because... Obviously, I feel, you know, half the time I feel embarrassed about doing these talks. You know, but I'm not going to play the fool here. You know, I'm, um, I'm just a person who, I, I don't know if I lost my way when I was a child, or it's more like I feel like I was, you know, hurt, and I wasn't dealing with it, no one was dealing with it, and, you know, rather than being a victim, I just decided I was going to survive. And so I had to find out. My long journey was just to find out what, what, what's going on, and I had to f try to survive, and, and, you know, why so many people ended up dead. And these are people, by and large, that were innocent ones. That couldn't, they couldn't grok this. They couldn't get that. They couldn't withstand this, in, this, this, this situation that, I'm, that we, we deal with. They couldn't, they weren't strong enough, and they... And they passed away. They, they, uh, whether it was an accident or somebody killed them or whatever, doesn't matter. They just didn't make it. So I sought to find out what happened to them too. And then when I read, <clears throat> yeah, come on, come on, frog in the throat. You always, when I'm about to say something important or something insightful or whatever, you know, the frog comes to the throat, even though I've been clear. And I got no issue, you know, it's just amazing. But I'm not going to let it stop me, you know. The reason these films like They Live and like this one and others, you know, have enduring resonance is because every single person, they connect with it on some deep level, even if they reject the idea that there is any conspiracy at all, that there's any... Satanism, Satan, demonic realm, demonic kingdom, or this is Satan's kingdom on the earth, and you know everyone has to kowtow to the devil, or they're are they going to be, you know, trounced, you know that sort of thing. That's how the Bible lays it out. Obviously, the Bible refers to this earth as uh, the valley of the shadow of death, <clears throat> you know, and that we're passing through it, and that we need God's protection to 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 make our way through. You know, God has set this whole thing up so that we have to rely fully on God to get through. And the reason I'm alive, because I, I shouldn't have been at least after 2010. I mean, that was, I was within a centimeter of death. You know, I, was, I, I had been poisoned. I went into a death rattle out and happened to be in Beverly Hills as well. So it, it's more of the same bizarre stuff that produced that screenplay so long ago. <clears throat> and even as early as 2010, it's still... There was still some kind of, you know, problem. You know, witchcraft was involved, which is, well, I was stupid, you know. I, I, yeah, 
I, I realize there are dangers out there, and I just I just guess that when you're like a lamb, you don't realize all the dangers out there, and you could walk into a nasty trap, which of course doesn't really exist. And then when you read the articles about this screenplay and the film and the you know they they don't talk about the writing much. It's really all about the you know directing and the, the special effects and whatever they did. You know, creating these weird characters. Um, they talk about it like, like I say, like I was crazy or being, you know, or whatever. And, um, and they made something out of that or something, you know, rather than, yeah, there's truth here. There's some truth here. Now, why do you suppose they would do that? So then I became like a scapegoat, you know what I mean? In other words, yeah, he's crazy. You know, we don't think it's really real. You know, uh, he had a fantasy that, you know, is, is, is some, what they call it, incest fantasy or some kind of fantasy about uh, Satanists or whatever who run the world. And then I wrote it up as, you know, and then they, they made it into something really good. But, I mean, that was the, that wasn't like that. I was writing about a conspiracy called society, not about a family, but about a society that, that rules the world, that is juxtaposed with this world, the Disneyland world, that we all you know, agree that you know, nothing weird here. We're just going to work. We're coming home. We're paying our bills, paying our taxes, you know, putting our kids through school. You know, that's all there is, right? And, you know, that this other world is juxtaposed and these other people are right up against us, like in the movie They Live. So I was really writing more like that. That was more the purpose of it. You know, that it, and, and then I was thinking that it's a work of fiction and then I was wondering if it was real. Which, of course, I had confirmation, in, which I didn't need, which devastated me completely. Pretty much ruined my life. But then again, it all led to something good in the end. I mean, you know, stubbornly, I, I kept trying to hold on to this idea of Disneyland, but of course it became harder and harder. Meanwhile, you know, people are looking at me like I'm crazy, I'm nuts, and I'm, I'm like, why are you treating me different than other people? If there is no conspiracy here, why wouldn't I, all things being equal, if I'm an honest dealer with you, why would you treat me like I'm nuts? If I'm being an honest broker here, and a straight shooter, why would you then treat me like there's some kind of weird thing going on? That reflection back to me indicates there's something else going on. You see what I mean? Proves that what I'm saying is true. You know? So if you... But, but why the secrecy? And, and, and even when they're doing this interview, they're talking like, oh, it was a fantasy. And, you know, I guess I'm somewhat of a scapegoat, you know, in a way. You can always put it off on me. And then, and then these are reasonable people. They don't believe this is just a horror movie. It's just, it's just fiction, you know what I mean? And the, the writer was so crazy, he thought he was writing about reality. But see, we, you know, we're, we're all reasonable here, you know. So there's this, even in the interviews, there's this line. And I'm on one side and they're on the other. Why would that be? If all things being equal, why not just be the screenwriter? Why? And then doesn't that then go to proving my case in the first place? You know, truth is a funny thing, you know. They all try to suppress it, but it had a way of coming back. Uh, I think, look, if, if, if the director of this thing knows the truth, which I think I'm pretty sure he does, uh, then this film's got to be a thorn in his side at the same time as being some kind of benefit to him. It's got to be some kind of awful... I mean, I remember the, the other writer that, you know, my friend Rick, he, he said he would say the curse of society, like it was a cursed project. And I think it is in a way. It's like an anvil that breaks people in two, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it certainly broke me. But say I'm not going to be the fool for them, you know. And I, I walked away from that. I, I, I wasn't being treated, you know. I mean, I, the reason I kind of, when I found the truth out, I had no desire to write any kind of screenplay again. You know, I had no desire to, you know, I sort of dabbled with, you know, a couple of independent films to direct. And I, 
And I realized I didn't like that. I, I, I don't even know why I did it. I, it's, it's, you know, I just, uh, uh, I have no regrets. I'm glad for the experience, but it wasn't really me. You know, me was really sound, you know. This podcast is really me. You know, the music I produce is me. It's really more me. This other thing was like I, I must have been used as some kind of vehicle or the truth had to come out or, you know, something had to happen. But looking back on it, it's just the, the ama amazing amounts of different things that happened. You just can't make it up. It's just, it's just beyond reason. It's beyond logic of all the circumstances that kind of were, were, were happening and then the confirmation about the world. Well, it wasn't. It was years later that I finally accepted the truth. I mean, I must have been, you know, throughout all the 90s, I was in denial. And uh, then eventually it became inescapable and all the sort of gang stalking started flaring up again and all this stuff. And finally I just had to go, okay, Lord, you know, okay, I'm just laying it all down for you. And that right there puts a wall up between me and them, you know, they're, I actually, when reading the interviews and I saw this embellishment and things that weren't quite true, but it's all marketing, you know, marketing, marketing. I felt sorry, you know, for the interviewer. I felt sorry for the director. I felt sorry for myself. I felt sorry for you know, people. I felt sorry for everything, for everyone, for the whole world. That's the reaction I had. Because the world, you know, this director, the interviewer, the world, they're not going to accept the truth. You know what I mean? They're, they're just in their own little world, you know, just, you know, t t thinking that they found a way to make it work. And, you know, and I, I, I mean, I see what happened. I understand, you know, and I might, uh, funny thing, I've seen this guy on Facebook too. And He's got all his adoring fans and, you know, people love all the, you know, there's the horror genre, same thing as the comic book genre, you know, they all kind of go together. So they're all at these comic cons that, you know, that it's, it's funny. They're, they, there's a lot of little kids there now, you know, they're kids and they're just be devastated. They read the HP Lovecraft and they read comic books, and they read graphic novels and they're, they're just hooked on the whole kind of genre, if you will. And, um, so he's kind of like the king of that genre. And that's, that's great. You know, I, I didn't want to you know, rob his spotlight. You know, he doesn't have to push me out. But I also understand, you know, it's just like the Christian pushing me out, not wanting to be associated. So what does that mean, people? Where they, in the name of Jesus, push you out or in the name of filmmaking, push you out, or, or any endeavor. And is it that they think you have cooties, like that'll hurt the project, or that'll hurt their chance to sell their books, or what does that mean? Because you know the truth? Because you're open with the truth and they're not? I don't mean to pick on poor Russ Dizdar, it's just that, you know, it's... It, it, it's, it's, he, sh he shouldn't have done what he did in, in, in saying that I was unstable because he's rejecting me. It's like, he, if that was the case, being an old friend who's been around and been uh, interviewed, the right response was, I need to minister to Zeff because he needs my help. But of course, that didn't happen. It was more the wrath uh, under I am crazy. Well, you know, needless to say, I won't be taking any, um, what is it, what is it, the, the, the spiritual warfare uh, seminars or whatever. No, um, you have to deal with honest people. You can't be with dishonest people, and he's dishonest. So, you know, right there, you, you, you know, God cannot bless that. And I think that's why he's had such a struggle financially is, you know, God's, you know, it's not going to bless. You can't reject me like that. You can't do that. And, you know, how many other people are in that same category? You know, you can't do that. And then feel justified. You know, if it, if it was like, we're two even, we're two men, and we're both 
have agreed that, you know, hey, we just don't get along. So, you know, that's something else. And that certainly wasn't, you know, you know, so therefore, you know, but this, this feeling I have, this devil trying to shame me through him, you know, that I need to be ashamed of myself because uh, he doesn't want to be seen with me. That's what it really is. And it's like I need to be ashamed of myself, continuing the shame from childhood, continuing the shame from having done nothing to anybody, but just coming in here and being assaulted. So I have to forever be ashamed of that or for, have results like, you know, this guy with his spiritual warfare. I mean, in, it, it, in one moment, he, he ruined his entire ministry in front of me. Right. I mean, you know, what conclusion would I? Oh, it's OK. You know, you're you go ahead and eat it, Seth. You eat it. And but he's OK. No, I'm sorry. He's not OK. And I'm not going to eat it. That's what they want me to do. Eat it. You know, be their fool. Come to them for absolution. Come to them begging forgiveness. So that one day I'll be, uh, you know, good enough for you to have coffee with me. That is complete and utter. You talk about insanity and, 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 and mistreatment. That is beyond mistreatment, beyond unfair. So, yes, I do bring it up. And I'm on very solid. Oh, you're talking about a brother in Christ. He put, have you work it out with him. Don't put it out on the airwaves, that. There is no working it out with him or them. This is the only way to work it out. In the light of day. And it's not like there aren't witnesses. So it is what it is, you know. And I would suggest that if, 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 if uh, this guy ever wants to come clean... That, you know, he, uh, you know, obviously will have to contact me. That's the only way it's going to work out. And that's not really going to happen. I don't care how, you know, if I, you know, I've, you call him out all you want, but that's not going to happen. It's always going to be, you know, the other guy's fault. Um, but it is the same result as the Hollywood, you know, fiasco. I was involved in it. Was the same exact result, whether you say you're Jesus business, film business, it doesn't really matter. So what do these people know? What do they know? And that's what I would ask if any of them, I'd say, well, what do you know? Look, I, I've been around the block enough to understand. I've talked to a guy yesterday that... You know, basically, he's, he's you know, I, I would sort of hint at things and he'd go, yeah, you know what I mean? It, they don't want to talk directly about any of this because it just freak, freaks people out. And I, and I respect that. People are not ready to handle any of this two-tiered world thing. That this, there's other deep, dark secret going on that, you know, people know, know, and the people who don't, you know, are kept in the dark, preyed upon the, by the people who know. And that's the thing I keep getting at. That, that, that's the ultra unfairness that the Lord is going to smash to bits when he brings his justice here. There will be that time. I have faith. I know. And I'm justified at saying this. And I'm justified at mentioning any name I feel like mentioning because of the travesty of the big picture of justice, of the big picture that, you know, various incidents and anecdotes about various people, it's not about them. It's about the big picture. I have every right to speak up as I ought to speak. You know, as I ought to use the gift that God gave me to use. So that other people can agree or disagree or at least have it in their mind so it's out there. They go, well, Zeph, you really put yourself out there. No, I don't. I don't put myself anywhere. I put the truth out there that most people don't want to deal with. They say, well, we want to be, have a low-stress situation here. 
we don't want to grapple with all this stuff. You know, we just want to have our lives and our, you know, our latte and our, uh, you know, hairdo and our, um, you know, concert tickets and our, you know, why can't we just have a life here? Why do you want to just take it all away from us? I'm like, well, you know, it's, it, there's a it's because the blood's crying up from the ground of all the innocent people you murdered. <laughs> so I'm sorry to, you know, uh, impinge on your lovely world. But there's a lot of people who aren't here right now because of, you know, people who have had that attitude. You know, and we're just dealing with spiritual issues. We're not dealing with anything. What is so awful about me? Or unstable about me and my process? Which, by the way, I've been nothing if not consistent over the years. Have I not? I've been an honest dealer with you, and I've been a, I've been a straight shooter. And I've, and I've spoken my mind, which is what the beauty of podcasts and blogging is that you get that personal, you know, that, that not through the homogenized lens of the mainstream media, you get the real raw thing, you know, not that everyone wants to deal with that. People want to be entertained. I understand. But this is also entertaining in a way, because if you're of, uh, you know, kind of on the same path I'm on, then you would love to hear this F report because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's what I needed back then. Don't you see? I'm talking to myself, a traumatized person who is all up, you know, and, and I couldn't find out anything. And now I'm ministering to myself way back there. I mean, I'm healing myself. Don't you see what I'm doing? The past is still going on just like the present. Don't you see? I'm healing myself live in front of you. Oh, and they go, oh, you need healing. No, no. You need healing. The mockers out there, the scoffers, they need healing. They're mentally ill. They're insane. Not me. I've got my wits about me, and I have my logic, and I'm very practical, and um, I'm, a, I'm a law-abiding citizen and a taxpayer, and completely looking this thing square in the eyes. But when people jump ship, and they, 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 they're embarrassed to be with you or whatever because of that you've told the truth, I think that's disgusting. I think that shows no backbone on their part. And I think that shows people that are just, you know, worthless. Because they're, they're, they've agreed to perpetuate the same curse upon us all on for another generation. They're going to kick the can down the road is what they're going to do. And I think that's disgusting. And that includes preachers, pastors, all kinds of fake Jesus people. I mean, all, all, all of it. Other religions, whatever. All just kicking the can down the road. You know, go along to get along. And who are you really getting along with? You're getting along with entities that hate you. That mean to do you harm and do you in. And get you recruit, recruit you to work on their side to devastate other people. You know, in exchange for you having your little life, your 2.5 children and your, your stupid job. And I don't care whether you sit on the board of 15 corporations, you still have a stupid job. You know, until you come clean, it's no job at all. You're just kicking the can down the road in your three-piece suit. Great. But I'll tell you something. You all complain about the world so much and about the evil that, you know, what Russia's doing or Trump is doing or, you know, other people are doing or people you don't agree with. And, you know, you're the one doing it. You're, you know, the center of your own hologram. All of us and everything that you see and perceive out there is a projection of you. In the end, you are responsible. We all are. You can never forget that. So, I live my life basically ashamed because that was what was reflected back to me. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And then I say, for what? And then they would change the subject. So all my works, anything I did, you know, it was always going to be someone else taking the glory and treating me as a second-class citizen. I mean, it was just like that was going to be it. 
Well, that's not acceptable to me, folks. And I do not accept that fate. And the people that want to put that fate on me are not only wrong, but they're evil. You know, at some point, enough is enough. Now, admittedly, some people, of course, go crazy, you know, and they can't handle all this. But um, I can. Now, my answer is, you know, I will continue with integrity, you know, to w w whether it be this, this uh, Zeph report thing or whether it be, the, you know, uh, music production, which uh, music production is a big deal. There are people that that's all they do is music production. I was talking to Rob, the guy that designed our studio here, and he was telling me he's putting in, like, huge sound systems and giant churches and sound systems and theaters and uh, studio design, and then he's also producing a, a couple of records coming up. A uh, big band starts next month, and he's got another band down in Texas that he's producing in a studio that he, I think he designed there. So... I say, why are you really busy? When are you going to see your kids? You know, it's like, well, I've, I say, well, it's going to be a good spring for you. And I, I warned him. I said, you know, right now, because he's a you know, totally you know, believer and, you know, happens to be very successful and a believer too, you know, it's, and a good guy, you know, really good guy and, and, and honest, honest. And um, not like other people I've been describing here. Um, but he... Uh, I warned him, just like I'm going to warn you, you know, right now, as far as the demonic realm and just the, you know, reversals of fortune and things, this is the, you know, betrayal out there, you know, uh, the, the, you see the, the instability of the markets, you see the instability of the world, you see the instability, you know, the violence and the, 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 the insane uh, criminality of Obama and what he's done with the, you know, with the Trojan horse, you know, ISIS refugees. They're not refugees, they're soldiers coming in here to, to be activated uh, for an overthrow of the United States. I, it's, it's absolutely insane. And any normal person, who's, which there are very few, looking at this would naturally be fearful. But, I mean, this betrayal is in the air. I know what I was telling Rob was, you know, people are going to start manifesting. Like if you have a job that you go to and, you know, a lot of people work in, and if you work in sales, you have cubicles, you have... You're going to see people popping, you know, here and there. And I mean, I'm assuming that you're a lamb and you, you know, you love the Lord. And that's, you may not be too verbal about it, but that's your way, right? That's our way. We know who we are. But they, they see who, what the, the spirit in you. They see the light in you. And it can happen from across the room, people you don't even know, and they come at you. And so I'm telling everyone to be heads up on this. They're coming at it. They're coming. The war, it's, it's ramped up right now like I haven't seen before. I thought it would be ramping down by now. But what got started, it seemed, on Christmas is really just escalated to now. I mean, everyone's at everyone uh, other's throat, but it's all the spiritual warfare of, like, the demonic thing that's in them. You know, if you're, if you are on the other side, you know, you have a demon, right, that really runs the show, right? And they see a lamb. You know, they don't, you don't need to tell you this is a lamb. No, they see. They're supernatural entities, and then they bark, and they use the human host to go, <laughs> or try to betray them, or, or, you know, if they're supposed to, you know, put an IV in of certain thing that might have the wrong drug, or the, you know what I mean? And just like be heads up, be heads up. I'm kind of switching the subject. Well, you know, I was triggered into remembering, you know, these times back in the late 80s, and, um, and um, my uh, having started, you know, having gone down the path of, like, writing, and I thought that's really what I wanted to do, and then I've learned, of course, I have that software, you know, it's like, it's like ever since I got a healing, you know, from the Lord, and clarity about things, I haven't, the idea of writing a screenplay, I like seeing movies, I like watching them. Not that one, not society. I've, I've, to me, that's... I mean, I don't even want to editorialize too much, but I, I, did, I was not a fan. You know, it's not my cup of tea. We'll just put it that way. But, uh, so I do not endorse. I can't. It's, it just doesn't... But I do enjoy movies when they work. But it seems like I'm doing a lot of effort trying to watch movies 
and being disappointed most of the time now, which I, it seemed I wasn't, you know, a few years back, it wasn't like that. Now there's all these, you know, people pushing agendas and having characters that represent certain social changes they want to see. And I'm, you know, you, it starts reeking of propaganda, you know, almost every film. It's not like the story is propaganda, but, you know, you have the characters that represent archetypes that are trying to create in our society. For example, the matriarchy is a big one they're pushing. The, 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 in the Hunger Games, it, it was not the handsome, strapping young lad, you know, the strapping young man that got the girl. It was the feminine, weak, weak kind of, uh, weak boy. Very, very effeminate. And the girl was very strong and a warrior. And he was like this very effeminate. And that he gets the girl and he gets to be like the house husband and take care of the kids while she's off on her adventure. You know, that's the meme they're pushing in the Hunger Games, which I think is disgusting. And it's immoral. And it's against nature. You know, men, for whatever reason, um, the, the idea of rewarding men for, for going effeminate is absolutely social engineering, and it is totally disgusting. Men need to be what they are. Women need to be what they are. And if there's de deviation, fine. But when it becomes propaganda promotion of, of that which is against God, you know, and there's no other reason for it, then you see it makes me uh, really sad. Sad how dumb people are, you know what I mean? And they're just, and the social engineers, because of that stupidity, you know, from being dumbed down, they feel that they could just mold people, you know, into whatever, you know. It's, it's a terrible, it's really, it's, 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 it's when, you, when your eyes are open, you realize just how much bigger this conspiracy is than you could have ever even fathomed, and how evil it is in terms of trying to destroy or, you know, pervert and corrupt God's, corrupt, God's creation. I mean, that's basically what it is. Had God not had a creation that was to be sacred and... and respected and, 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 you know, um, and morals and, and all that. So they throw all that out. And these are the people that are running the show these days, you know. The communist is nothing if not a pervert in every way. Perversion of, you know, justice, perversion of sex, perversion of uh, what's a woman, what's a man, perversion of, of, rea perversion of reality is the way I should describe it. You know, people call it the war on reality. I call it the perversion of reality and the perversion of God's word. It's just basically anything that's against that is, is, is their mana. That, that's their God. And so, you know, now they're even talking about their own destruction. They're talking about white people shouldn't even be uh, on this continent. And I saw an article today <laughs> where the German men, it's, it's, it's not the German women, but the German men shouldn't have ever been born. The German men are the problem, not the, uh, the rapists coming in, raping all the children and the women, and, and killing people and stealing things of the so-called refugees, which are not. They're just basically, you know, uh, thugs and criminals. And, you know, so they're coming in, but it's the, the white European German male that's really the problem that needs to be eradicated from Germany so that these refugees can have a better experience. So they're blaming it all on the German men, the whole conflict. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Nothing like that could happen unless the initial conspiracy that I was beginning to talk about at the beginning of the hour, or whatever hour this is, uh, that would all have to be true in order for this to exist, in order for these kinds of things that we see for them to go on. It speaks to a hidden satanic reality that's pushing it all. Yes? So, you know, I'm sorry, filmmakers who made society. You people are all liars. You know? It, you know damn well what, what was going on. And act like, they act like they don't. They act like, oh, no, he was crazy. No, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're saying. They, they feel they can get away with it because they can blame it on some crazy guy. They don't believe it. So then they won't be harassed. 
That's, that's really the breakdown of it. Like I say, it's sad, Look, having read the articles and looking back, it was, you know, I'm dealing with it today. It's sad because in a way, the guy being older, you know, Hollywood doesn't thrive on older directors. I mean, he's an icon for sure in the horror genre, but, you know, it's like this thing that's a thorn in his side, this, <laughs> this story is the thing he has to go out and deal with <laughs> in terms of doing talks and you know, showing up at the screening and talking to the audience and then screening the, you know, and having, it's just funny, maybe, you know, this is the, the you know, he's, he's supposed to be a guardian of, of such secrets, of such things. And he's having to, and so he, he, he says, yeah, it's all symbolic and we're really writing about the class system and he's getting into all this sort of intellectual bullshit that has nothing to do at all with, with the story. And like, you know, people didn't even know what kind of what we were doing back then, but we were, everything was carefully put in, you know, and, and to, tell a, a, to tell a story about the social maladies of our time, in other words, secular stuff, when the whole thing points to another reality. Even suggesting somewhat of a conspiratorial, interdimensional conspiracy of time and space being manipulated, which didn't, didn't, didn't come through the story at all. But I mean, that's, you know, it gets scary when you start seeing the interdimensionality of it. That is people that you thought you knew manifesting into people that uh, you don't even recognize. This happened with my own mother, you know, from time to time when I was just asking her what was going on. And I'd see her change into something that I, I didn't even recognize. Someone in, someone in there who had total supernatural nature, like for example, she looked like she was glowing, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, and there was something in her eyes that almost looked like robotic for a minute, you know? Because they were kind of like going back and there was something, someone in there, you know? And uh, yes, of course, we've been talking about this for years here, but I mean, you know, I experienced that firsthand and, and uh, I got the feeling that if she wanted to levitate or go through the ceiling, she could do it. You know, that kind of supernatural power, you know? Like I wasn't dealing with a human being there at all. And, um, and then she'd be back to her normal self later on. And when she manifested like that, we were talking about the aliens. I was talking about the, the spaceships that I felt were around and, you know, this alien issue back in the 70s. And, um, then when I was talking to her, it was like she was one of the entities that was in her talking to me in a different voice and everything, you know, about the fact that they are real and that they are, they're very interested in me, me, Zeph, me. They, they're very interested in me, they, you know, and the truth is in my heart and if I just follow my heart, it's all going to be okay. I said, what are you talking about? End of conversation. It's always the end of the conversation. Why aren't you, why do you think I'm unstable and that's of grounds for breaking fellowship with me? When that's a lie. You must break fellowship with me, conformed Christian, because um, you can't be seen with the, the fool, the crazy man. It's just too much baggage. It's just, it will hurt your chances of someone buying your stupid book. I used to have arguments with this. Remember when, when Patty Heron was around? Remember that? And he's gone. And they're all going to die pretty soon, all these people. But uh, I remember, you know, I, I had red flags. I just didn't believe his book about the pyramids and all that. And, and he couldn't even spell Yahweh right. It was like Y-A-W-E-H. There was no H after y, Y-A-H. It was like... Uh, so I didn't like that either. You know what I mean? It's just there was something about the thing that it just it just was coming from a guy who'd just been to too many 
Bible studies. He had been to two, you know what I mean? He was just all intellectual about everything. They, I'm like, man, are you even alive? And the sad thing about him is, he never really was alive. I mean, he had his faith, and I'm no doubt that he's gone to, to, to the Lord. I, I do believe that that, but it's sad that he just couldn't open his eyes. He couldn't see anything. He had no real prophetic utterance about anything. He was just part of the system. And he never, never did wake up. And so I'm trying to understand now and heal, see. So I'm, I'm beginning to think that what happens to people is that when they sign on to the system, they, they, something happens to them <clears throat> where they don't believe, they believe that it's real, that there isn't any other conspiracy or anything like that going on, even though the thing that got them hooked into the system is and, and, and always will be in and of itself supernatural and a cause for red flags to go up, you know, obviously. So then one wonders, how much do they know? Or do they know and they're not telling? Are two-thirds of the population of the earth know and they're not saying anything? They know they're such, they know all, lots of stuff and they're not saying a damn thing about it. They may not know about the interdimensionality of things. But, of course, any reasonable person would have to conclude that because there's no logical way a lot of things that happen could happen unless there was an interdimensional component to our reality. Otherwise, uh, you could not explain half the things that happen around here, around this earth, including day-to-day -day, you know, rolling out of reality, which is different on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know if anyone recognizes that, but tomorrow is never going to be the same day as today. I mean, it's always like a, another, like a set change, you know, a new scene, new chapter. Uh, the past is irrelevant. It's like they try to bring, you know, Bill Clinton, they, you know, Trump successfully bringing his past in. But for the most part, you know, uh, he, he could be a total rapist and Hillary could get elected because there's some weird kind of psychological illness that's taken over our society. Where, you know, the, 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 it doesn't matter if you're a criminal or whatever, if you're on the right side of things, approved of by, obviously, the devil, then um, you can get elected no matter what you've done. Or what you do, or what you say. Nothing, there is no past. It's just the next soundbite, the next soundbite. And that's all people are programmed to do. And that's how Barack Obama got elected. The next soundbite, the next, it didn't matter if there was a birth certificate or... If, there was a record in school, or everything got buried with him. If if his wife is a tranny and and he's he's gay, and the kids are from cloning, it really doesn't even matter. It's the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. It's a collective psychosis, and with people who are in it and who are completely nuts, calling the kettle black, calling people that disagree with them crazy, or people that think outside the box like me crazy even if we're law-abiding citizens, even if we're reasonable, they just don't like us because they, you know, we're, 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 we're deigning to question reality. We're deigning to, you know, daring to, to, to question their authority. We're daring to, you know, we're, we're in their mind complaining about, you know, what we should be happy to have. And I'm sorry, but, you know, the world that I want to see is a world where people, people are miserable in this country. I, I hope you understand that. And they're miserable in Europe. They're miserable all over the world right now. The economy is tanking everywhere. You know, and, and the people at the helm are taking zero responsibility for their complete and utter failure. Obama has completely failed. He's failed economically. He's failed in foreign policy. He's failed in every way possible to the point where you'd say, maybe it's intentional. They're beginning to think that, well, of course it's intentional, you know, from my point of view, but they're beginning to even entertain the idea that he's done all this stuff on purpose. Um, stuff that would have a, a, a person shot for treason, you know, it, uh, or at least thrown in jail, you know. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's amazing that the people could just break the law and get away with anything, you know, including, you know, uh, putting executive orders that are unenforceable and, and unconstitutional and just, just proudly sticking his stupid nose up in the air and acting like, you know, I'm the dictator and when I, whatever I spew out, you'll just take it. 
And then you have all these uh, people on the left who are just like, whatever he says, oh, yes, master, oh, yes, master. And, and I, I'm just, it's, to me, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to be an American because of how stupid people are in this country. I'm embarrassed when I've, you know, I'm not embarrassed of the works that I've done because I've not done anything in this life. And so I've been trying to figure out what happened. That's basically it. Why, why the trauma and what the, you know, what, whatever. I'm just one of these kind of people that seeks the truth. So that's what I was doing. So I'm not going to be shamed for having done that. I understand when there's an abuser and the child is beginning to have memories about being abused and they start getting close. The abuser manifests and tries to shame that child so that that child never speaks up, so the truth never comes out because they just can't have the truth. To, they would to, to show what people really are, what, what they've really been involved with, what they really do behind closed doors, what's really going on. And that is, affects every human being on the face of this earth. And that's why things like, you know, They Live or even campy movies like Society and other things, that's why they survive year after year because people, they, they all need healing on this. They all know there's a two-tiered reality, or most do. My daughter knows. She's 25. She knows. But they try to cope anyway. It's like they know, they try to cope anyway, and then they all... They all participate in the cover-up. And if anyone spouts off, they're the crazy one. That is disgusting, ladies and gentlemen. That is just morally, you know, in any shape or form in this entire universe, that's just wrong. Finding people to blame who are just earnestly seeking to understand why they feel lousy why they feel ashamed of themselves, why they feel like, why they're having trouble coping. They're trying to find out what the story is. And in that quest, they're shamed. 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 My life was ruined, I guess, from being ashamed. Being ashamed of being, you know, ashamed because I was a victim at, you know, five years old or whatever. So, so from that point on, I've been dealing with shame that wasn't put on me by myself, but that I've been trying to solve so I could have a decent life. And as I try to solve it, I get nothing but people, you know, reinforcing that shame and, and calling me out as some kind of pariah or something because I'm trying to find out what happened. And let me tell you why they're doing that. They're doing that because they're all participants in it. That's why. In this massive cover-up of, of something that basically snaps people in two and ruins lives and ruins the world and ruins the economy, ruins everything for everyone. And rather than dealing with it, we just sit here uh, doing nothing as it gets worse and worse and worse until finally there'll be a mass bloodbath, obviously, from war because that war is a complete failure of our society. Uh, but it's also a great healer in a way. You know, war will kill this time billions of people in a nuclear war, and then that will somehow be a healing. I mean, it's, it's, it's it, and, and the result of society going completely decadent and never dealing with the truth. And eventually the chickens come home to roost. Now, you know I'm telling the truth, and you know that makes sense. So my situation was not unique, was um, in, the, in the words that I got from my mother, you know, that she, half the time in one of her personalities, she was very, um, you know, honest about things. And then in others, she was deceptive, and you had to really figure out who you were talking to. <laughs> but yeah, but she would say, like, you know, everybody's been abused. Everyone knows. And that's, that was her answer. Everybody knows. And then she would go, you know, and I'd say, what about these people? And she says, don't bother, honey. They've all gone to the devil regarding old friends. All, mob, all? Anyway, she was always true in that, in that particular mode of her. She was always, you know, true. And I really did a, that really helped me to understand, you know. And then she'd say, so therefore, 
And then, of course, the conclusion she has is different from mine. Therefore, you know, go along to get along. Therefore, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. That's what she would tell me. You know, you've, you can't fight. The, it's the whole world. Everyone's been abused. Everything is corrupt. And so just cut your deal, you know, to, to make, make, you know, don't be a fool. Or, you know, you're going to be in hell. And then, of course, the supernatural stuff that follows, the gang stalking. I, one time I tried to explain to her about what's been happening. She goes, I know what's been happening to you. Well, how could you know you weren't there? I know. You mean about the weird things in the street and the coincidences, the phone ringing, and people talking about the same conversation I just had with somebody else somewhere else where they couldn't know who I was, you know, and then the whistling and clearing the throat and all the making noise and, uh, you know, all those kind of things, I know. But it's kind of your fault. Meaning, you know, give give the devil your soul and then, you know, thou, that stops on day, that stops the second you give in. All that. What if it doesn't work? Well, then I feel sorry for you. Because it doesn't always work. Well, I know that. So for the people that are just here, trying to find out what happened, trying to deal with their own abuse issues or whatever, trying to find some kind of justice, some kind of peace, they're just going to go through hell, right? That's right. They're losers. Get away from them. Well, that's just not good enough for me. I really do need to have a world based on the Lord and based on, you know, what's good is good, what's bad is bad, you know, right is right, wrong is wrong. You know, I don't mind the gray area, but it has to be kind of tending toward that direction or I really, you know, have a problem. And then when I see so many people demon-possessed and then manifesting, which I'm warning people about today in this podcast, they're going to be popping off all around you. So if you're in the gang stalking thing, you know, basically, if that's what, what you want to call it, it's, to me, it's just spiritual warfare. Yes, they'll be following you and whistling and making noises and, and putting things in your way in the aisle and, and, and talking about things that, that, are, that pertain to you that uh, only you would know. And uh, yet they're having an open conversation that sounds awfully similar to what you know. And are they really talking about you? And you got to find out and you feel harassed and you better go hide under a tree. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, My mother would go, I know. Well, how could you? Are you running it? And it's all, no, but it's your fault. Why is it always my fault? You know, these things wouldn't happen to you. If, you know, you you would just see sense and just be normal and just stop it. In the end, she finally said, well, you know, obviously you were made that way. You know, there's nothing you could do. You are what you are. There's nothing I could do. And she admitted that was true. It's, it's choice has, you know, you may have choice, but God made you what you are. See what I mean? So you could only really choose what you can choose. I could only choose to go with the Lord because he made me that way. You know, how many times was I hanging around the, 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 the worlders, you know, bouncing off the mirror, you know, unable to pass through because of, of supernatural intervention, yes, but also of the way I was made. So then I have to ask, are people that are lambs, you know, which they call us, you know, because we're lambs of God, we're also sons of God, but people like that, are we not allowed to be here? And I know them from all walks of life and all races, all economic strata, I know them out there. And we, we get along great. We don't have any problems like what I've described earlier about, you know, no, no, I feel sorry for people in the... Look, I understand there's a film business and you have 
you know, you, you got to promote stuff. Everyone's always promoting everything. And so they're embellishing the story and embellishing the story and, you know, keep it going and keep it going. And, you know, I just had to, you know, that merry-go-round was just, you know, another, you know, I, I saw all I needed to see there and I stepped off. No, I'm, no, I'm not for sale. I, I'm not up to, I was thinking about doing a, another independent film, you know, but then I, then I realized I could do it sonically. You know what I mean? It's, uh, I, I realized I'd, I do it on the podcast every day, but I have, instead of like a two hour thing, I've got thousands of hours. So I think it's more win-win this. The podcast is the, is such a miracle because it, it changed the world. Everything is podcasting. Everything is portable media. It's, it's just amazing. Including, you know, in the future of movies will be all portable media. But I'm kind of, you know, like I say, I'm growing less and less patient with the movies because the people making them, who they're coming from, are not people that I would be able to get along with anyway. Because, you know, they're basically... Uh, schmoozers and liars. I mean, that's what you have to be, you know, in, uh, to get along in Hollywood, a liar and a, and a schmoozer, right? And a butt licker. And basically, um, you know, th that's the game they play. And butt licker could include any form of sex you can imagine. <laughs> and then some, you know, uh, as you're trying to, you know, F your way to the top there, uh, especially for the men. And I'll just leave it there. But bottom line is, I saw that merry-go-round, and I was like, that's just not... And I've seen people... Yes, there were a lot of people that were interviewees and who were making films. It turns out that I had interviewed filmmakers. And they all were going to, like, the, the, the Hollywood Presbyterian Church near Highland. I'm not sure what, where that church is. but Not on Highland, but it's near there somewhere. Anyway, I think I know where it is. It was on Franklin somewhere in Hollywood, but, you know, the, 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 the sort of Christian conservative hangout for these filmmakers that are trying to stay under the radar. Well, guess what, filmmakers? I knew that was never going to work out. You people have gotten nowhere in Hollywood, okay? Being under the radar like you are and going to this uh, Pres Hollywood Presbyterian church, thinking like you're, you know, you're hanging out and you're, you're fighting the good fight. You do, you've done nothing, you haven't moved the ball one inch, and most of you are out of work. So good for you. Nice keeping your mouths shut, because you'd have to. You all know where the bodies are buried. You know what's happened to you. You know what you had to do, all right? You know what they made you do. And, and instead of having a testimony like me, of an honest testimony before the Lord, you lied in the name of Jesus. So, you know, these people, like, they were on my show, and then, you know, I didn't have them back again because they gave me the creeps. Later I find out, you know, they're full of crap. They're not going to come clean. There's no answer there. Closest I had was a record producer who was a commercial record producer saying, yeah, the same requirement of selling your soul in, in the record business is the same as in, you know, in uh, rock and roll, the same with you know, as it is in the Christian music. I said, no wonder I kind of, you know, I'd hear these groups doing, you know, the Christian songs and give me the creeps. It wasn't the song that was giving me the creeps. It was the vibe that was on the record. I could feel it. As opposed to, say, somebody that is just a lamb that's playing an acoustic guitar on YouTube and singing Amazing Grace, and then, then I can feel the spirit on that. And it's like, yeah, that's a... That's a person, then there are a lot of, I mean, what I'm saying is that there are an awful lot of people, the wheat and tares go together, so there's a lot of people everywhere that belong to the Lord who may not even realize it, who are lambs, you know, they, they don't, they don't even know about this whole other world, they, they read about it in the Bible though, see that's why there's no excuse, because you, you learn from the Bible that this isn't what it's presented to be upon the earth. It's not what we're presented with in school or on television. What this whole world is, is this basically a gauntlet. It's a, um, it's a test. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a hellish war-torn environment. 
you know, underneath the surface. And then the surface is kind of, at least it has been up to now, although that's breaking down now. The surface had been this sort of leave it to beaver thing. And then the underneath had been this roiling, murderous, perverted, horrible, hellish nightmare. And that people were expected to cope with both, preferring to live in the surface reality and then hoping to ignore the other reality, you know, so they can, so they can cope and they can get through it. Uh, and then busting anyone who's talking about it as crazy and excising them from society so they can keep their little plastic world going. And that's what I finally understood about it all is that, you know, I guess most everyone understands. Or as my mother said, everyone's been through the same thing, so why they lie in their interviews like about the movie and things like that or me or I don't know you know who are they fooling trying to keep you know well we're really talking about the economy and things I mean who are they fooling this was about out and out spiritual warfare about crazy internet inter, interdimensional coinky dick stuff I mean this is not this is this is uh, you know it's you're dealing with a very uh you know, radioactive thing here. And, you know, that's the very thing, that radioactive vibe, if you will, that keeps stories like that going, that keep films like they live going. It's got that radioactive thing on it, you know, and it's just always going to be around as a result. But there's flack, too, for having exposed reality for more or less what it is. And then, you know, the reason the powers that be don't feel bad about, say, they live, is, is because they live isn't going to change the, the landscape. It's not going to expose anything for people. It's like the people who know kind of nod and go, yeah, okay. And the people that don't, it's not going to change their view at all. They're just going to see it as a sci-fi movie. So there's nothing to be worried about or concerned about. So they're going let it, to let it play. It's not going to change the world. No. It's not going to be the thing that unearths the big concern. Because, you know, people feel guilty. They all feel like they participate in something evil. You know what I mean? When people do wrong, how they're, they, they feel guilty about it and they feel ashamed in a way. But we can't have a society of everybody feeling ashamed. So we need to create scapegoats and, and things to blame it on. We need to have politics, two political parties, point the finger at the other guy. We need to deflect that shame, deflect that guilt so that we can cope. And that's, <clears throat> in a way, what I, how I see our collective problem. The answer, of course, is always is Jesus. It's, it's the Lord. It's the way of the Spirit. It's, it's, you know, I mean, I dance with the one who brung me, the God of the Bible. The, the, you know, I was always running after every other religion but Christianity, but I'm not running after Christianity as a religion. I'm not, you know, really, I don't think, acceptable as a Christian because of the way my mind works because of the things I talk about, you know, they makes them very, very frightened, very nervous. And they, they want to be, you know, in a homogenized little, <laughs> in, for the most part, they want to be in a homogenized little world where they're told what reality is every Sunday and, and maybe Wednesday night at Bible study. And, you know, they cope that way. And that's, that's fine for them. That's one level of, of uh, that's one spiritual level, but that's not the level that I'm on. I more have to address the world. Now, I've got to turn to other matters now. I mean, this is just like, you know, I feel I am getting a healing because I don't feel ashamed of what I've done, you know, which i would lived my whole life feeling ashamed of everything. You know, ashamed of having been in the family I was in, you know, having had privilege. And then obviously it looked like I squandered. I didn't do anything. I was just me and the things that happened, happened. But I'm not ashamed of my birth. I have cursed my mother's womb. Absolutely, I've done that. I've cursed my life. I hated being mocked and laughed at. I hated it. It seemed like my whole life, I, you know, I couldn't do anything about it. They just kept on mocking and laughing and mocking and laughing. I'm like, I don't see what's so funny. And bullying and lying and uh, any other hateful thing. But I, I understand now the nature of the whole thing, so I understand it. I don't hold anyone personally responsible. 
Nope. You know, I mean, I even know, you know, like in the Christian rejection and all that, I don't hold them responsible. Them personally, you know, that, that participated in such things. I mention them, but I don't, I don't hate them. You know what I mean? I understand. See, that's the thing. I don't think I'm communicating to you properly. I understand where they're coming from. If I were them, I probably would do the same thing. So I, I have compassion for them, but I'm not going to be their victim. Okay? I'm not going to eat their crap. That they, they should eat it themselves. I'm not going to eat what they're dishing out. I'm not going to accept the way they define me because the way they define me is incorrect. It's not the truth. Um, and, and, and speaks more to the definition of who they are rather than who I am. And that's the healing specifically that I have received. Understand? And because of that healing, now I'm not saying that I won't have a regression, you know, and feel ashamed again of just being, you know, I don't know, you could feel ashamed, they try to shame you for being a white or white privilege, so you feel ashamed. You know, it's all about shaming. So they shame you if you're getting close to the truth, right? But then if you're really a truth teller, then the, of course don't be ashamed. If you're earnestly seeking the truth, then my, my goodness, don't be ashamed. But I mean, in Christian circles and in the prophecy wars online, it's, I just had one the other day. I had shame one and two, you know? <clears throat> a woman coming on my page specifically to just shame me. You know, that's her whole life is going around shaming people. I'm sure she shames lots of people on YouTube too. There are people on YouTube, they go around in these prophetic circles and, you know, where the word's being shared and stuff, and they just start shaming people. Oh, well, you can't really be a real one because you still listen to heavy metal. Or, you know, you're, you allow uh, strange artworks in your house. Look, you're actually making a film. Only Satanists make films. Um, you know, and I have to be very careful, too, not to condemn everyone and everything because that makes, then I am crazy. Then that does make me look like an idiot, like this, this woman. And I don't want to be like that. She's making the mistake that people make. They get saved, and the next thing you know, they're out there teaching everyone about the gospel and, and showing the right way because the whole Internet's wrong, and we're all wrong, and everyone's wrong. But they have the answer. You know, there's, there's that. And then, you know, some people never grow out of that. They just feed on attacking other people. You know, and it's all in Jesus' name, so it's all legit. So that's really more the, the, the area I'm working in now. That, that's, now, do, do they affect me at all? No, when they do stuff or write things about me or whatever they say. Um, no, I don't feel the shame anymore. I mean, I'd love to be able to retort, but the Lord tells me to stand down mostly on that because he said, he has told me you can't win against Jezebel in a arg straight-up argument because you're dealing with, this, with the whole with the whole principality there. That is, um, you know, to, to other people, it would just look like you're the, the, the one failing because, you know, you're not going to lie. They will lie. You're not going to twist the truth. They will twist the truth. You're not going to twist it to make them look bad. You're going to say straight up why you think they're in the wrong. They're going to twist it and twist the truth and lie to make you look bad, though, something you're not going to do back to them so you can't win. So walk away. I think that's pretty good advice from the Lord. That, that came through other people, you know, numerous times. So I feel that's from him. And uh, I now feel I know it's from him. And so I'm, you know, I've, I've had good success in following that very method of, you know, not allowing the Jezzies to shame me. And they're always women. And they're always, you know, I draw them out. And then they come around and the next thing you know, they're, they're going at it. How can you call yourself a Christian? You're a hater, just like, you know, I was compared once to Randy Moggins. Remember him? We got the whole thing. I was accusing him of being a Nazi uh, because of his uh, anti, you know, Israel thing. And um, I mean, that's was ages ago. But he said, you're going the way of Randy Moggins. He's rejected the Bible. And I haven't kept up with him, but I understood that he and people like, uh, oh, who was that guy? Ronnie McMullen, other people, they were so heavy into the Bible and the God of the Bible and Scripture and Bible prophecy. 
and I understand they tossed it out. Which, of course, doesn't surprise me. That's, that's more honest, you know, rather than trying to, you know, twist it. But they were saying, you're going the same way when you say the Bible is not the, you're not the infallible word of God or whatever. You know, when I went through that in, uh, non-infallibility thing, I think the Lord had me doing that just to draw these people out. To me, I'm not giving up my Bible, I'll tell you that. For me, it is, an, it is infallible in my hands, but not in everyone's hands. Amen. It can be twisted in the wrong hands or misunderstood or, or, or you know, there all kinds of things can happen. It's a, it's a rough, rough uh, path. You know, it really is. You know, that's, there's not an agreed upon Disneyland here. You know, it's like, and if, if the Lord gives you an interpretation that the whole, whole the masses out there don't share, they're going to try to shame you. They're going to jump on you and they're going to try to kill you. The reason I bring up being, you know, rejected for being crazy is that was the same thing that was happening.